Hello and welcome to the 45th episode of Seoul's 2022 Year of the Ecological Garden webinar series. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. My name is Christine Earnshaw and I'm the Special Projects Lead with Seoul. I live in Ottawa, the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg, who have lived in this region for millennia and have much to share about ecological approaches to land stewardship. For today's presentation, I'm pleased to introduce the founder of Grand River Food Forestry, Nicola Jane, an award-winning ecological landscape designer, author, speaker, and community capacity builder. Nicola's presentation today is entitled Sankofa Equity and Food Sovereignty. Her presentation will be approximately 20 minutes, and then there'll be time for Q&A. Finally, I'd like to mention that this webinar series and much of Seoul's work is made possible by the generous and ongoing support of Gaia College, Canada's leading college for professional development and diploma courses in organic land care. So with that, let's begin. Over to you, Nicola. Thank you so much. I'm um, really appreciative to be here today and thank you for um, sharing what I'm doing in my work. And hopefully you'll enjoy this presentation. So as you said, it's about equity and food sovereignty, which is our ecological and mental wellness, landscapes mitigating climate change, care for the earth, care for each other and share the wealth, which is Ujama, cooperative economics, shared work and wealth. As we gather, let's remember that we're on the land that is the traditional home of many indigenous people. We recognize the contributions of indigenous peoples and African diaspora peoples have made in shaping and strengthening this community. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to the place we each stand today. Remembering our global indigenous roots and creation stories. Our agricultural history connects us back to our creation stories, soil and to each other. All creation stories have minerals on the top, then plants, then animals, then us as humans. So we sort of have that a little bit twisted whereas we put ourselves on top. In land observation, preservation, regeneration and reconciliation. So land management, as we look at it, food hubs and food systems analysis cannot exist without acknowledging the contributions of indigenous and African diaspora histories. As we go through, you'll see in the corners that I have um, some of the sustainable development goals. I don't have all of them, but you'll see some of them are relatable. Um, so Canada's food price reporters of 2018, this is some time ago, and um, obviously we know that now the numbers have changed. Unfortunately, those numbers have increased. So this was published by Dalhousie University and the University of Guelph, an increase of three to five percent in food prices. So fresh fruit was up 12 percent um, and fresh veggies was up 18 percent. So I started my journey with food forestry with this container of raspberries you see here on the left. I bought an organic, this is not organic, but I bought an organic um, uh, container of raspberries for my three children and it cost me about seven to eight dollars. And um, if you're a gardener, you know that most people don't even plant raspberries because they're so prolific and they take over your yard. So the idea to spend seven or eight dollars <throat> on the raspberries um, seemed really far-fetched. And that's how I got into food forestry and thinking about making food more accessible for, for many more people. So the impact of um, gl the global industrial food system and on climate impact and global increase in food prices, the UN Food and Agricultural Organization has made a powerful plea to return to regenerative farming based on agroforestry. So three to 5% increase in food prices. In 1965, 4% of the population had chronic illness. Now 46% of children have chronic illness. Urban areas account for nearly 60% of energy use and 70% of CO2 emissions. This is from the International Energy Agency, 2008. So what is agroforestry? It's a land management approach that purposely integrates the growing of trees and crops. So you can see here the seven layers of a food forest. Looks very much like a, a regular forest. So we're talking about polycultures versus monocultures. Monocultures are basically what we do in industrial farming is we'll plant just one type of crop. Now the issue with that is that if you have um, some kind of a drought or you have an insect um, 
if you have, a, then what will happen is you lose all of your crops. In a polyculture, um, that won't happen because you have many other um, species growing and they are either attracting pollinators or detracting. So in the seven layers of the food forest, you can see the top layer is the canopy. Then we go down to the lower layer of a tree, like dwarf trees. And then we go to the shrub layer, which is our berry bushes. Often in food forestry, what we'll do is fedges, which are food hedges. Because with the larger plants, like the fruit trees, you need sort of a champion that's going to take care of them. And because we plant them in public spaces, we don't necessarily always have that. So we often will start with the berry layer. Um, and then you go down to the herbaceous layer the root crop, um, the ground cover. Now ground covers are really important because they stop soil, wind, sun erosion. And then the vertical layer, which we often don't think about is that we can grow fruit vertically. So what is permaculture? Permaculture is a philosophy of working with rather than against nature, of protracted and thoughtful observation rather than protracted and thoughtless labor, of looking at plants and animals in all their functions rather than treating any area as a single product system. So when we're planting, we're ensuring that we're including um, insects and um, pollinators because they're definitely integral to, to the process. So, and this is not a news, global food forestry is something that's been practiced in millennia. On the right here, you can see a photograph of an East Indian man in his food forest. Now, what's interesting about East, uh, the East Indians is that they will buy a property, build a house, have their children. When their children grow up, they'll build another house on that same property. But the garden stays the same and keeps getting fed more and more. So what is no-till gardening, which is a, um, a practice that we use in permaculture? It is biomimicry. So it's basically mimicking what nature does. So if you think about a forest, a forest never goes um, and tills and turns the soil. It just keeps adding to it. So that is the idea. So and when you're digging the soil, it ruins the soil structure that's already there. We have millions of soil biotas that we're disrupting. It's less work um, with the no-till, which everybody can aspire to, and it gives you more time to relax. It also makes it more accessible for people with disabilities. Um, so what does that look like? No-till lasagna gardening. So we do first a layer of cardboard. Now what that does is it suppresses the weeds and um, the grass. And also um, worms use it for bedding and they like it for food. So that's where the no-till comes in because the worms are gonna come up and do that work for you. So then after we've done that, what we do is we we'll do a layer of compost on top of that. And then as you can see here on the right, a layer of straw. Now the layer of straw, what that does is it creates um, a structure and then it, it allows the, um, the bed to create um, tunnels for air and for microorganisms and for um, water. So if you have very compacted soil, what happens is the water just rushes right over the top. So we want to create these little um, uh, pathways, if you will, for water and air and the biotas to go through. Then what we do is we'll plant the berry bushes in there. Um, and then on the very top, we put wood chips. Wood chips are fantastic for um, any type of soil. It amends any type of soil when you put that in. And you, you'll know that from in your soil, in your gardens, what you'll find when you find um, sticks and branches, you'll find like a white powder. That's mycelium. That's what we're after. And that's what we're trying to grow here. And that's how plants um, deliver sugars to each other and communicate. So when we're talking about um, tilling the soil, what does that mean? So if you see, I'm a visual person, so that small teaspoon has millions of beneficial insects that you can't see with the naked eye that are necessary when growing food. So here are some of them. So you can see that one hectare of soil contains 15 tons of organisms, the equivalent to the weight of 20 cows. So that'll let you know that 
um, when you're tilling the soil, these are all the insects that you need in your soil. And that's why most farmers that practice monocultures will have to add fertilizer. In this process, you don't have to add fertilizer. So when we think about um, the planet and you know we're all coming off a of pandemic now and what happened when we're in lockdown, um, this is biomimicry at its best is seeing what nature does. So what we found was that in the pause of the two months, air pollutions plummeted, animals reclaimed the land, the Himalayas were visible from India, dolphins swam in the Venice canals, people connected with nature and with each other. Um, so it gives us a great um, indication that we're always with this idea of what to do, what to do. And sometimes it's just to not do anything and sit back. So these are some of our ecological collaborators. I wanted to put this image together because these are all of the animals and birds that are interacting with my garden. And I live in Kitchener, Ontario, so I have a very small backyard. But when you put them on a screen like this, you can see just how many are interacting with your site on a daily basis. So these are um, our collaborators and we very much need them when we're talking about agriculture. For instance, with the bee, if the bees die, we die. The number of wild animals worldwide is halved in the last 40 years. So it's very important that we start to think about agroforestry and this idea of polycultures. So what are the benefits? Food security, nutrition and cash income when plants reach maturity, forest or habitat to an estimated 80% of the world's biodiversity, it's food to wildlife and homes to many pollinator species, increases soil health for agriculture, vegetation cools the soil and decreases evaporation, providing shade and humidity, a place of refraction, relaxation, educational tours, medicinal herbs, wildlife habitat, pollinator corridors, and permaculture teachings. Mitigates climate change by absorbing carbon dioxide and storing carbon stimulates the water cycle, increasing rainfall and retention in the soil. It also diverts water from the water systems. So this is when we're talking about food forestry. We usually plant them. This is um, the um, Forest Heights food forest that we planted some years ago. Um, and it's a different idea than community gardens, because if you think about community gardens, you get a plot and then it's no longer community, it's your personal space. So the idea of food forestry is that we're increasing the biodiversity, mitigating climate change, but then making um, fresh organic food accessible to everybody. It crosses barriers of age, gender, culture, and religion. Why? Because everybody eats. So we've had many sites where we've built and I've had people come that don't speak English and have brought their own tools and shared with us their tools that they use. So we don't even need language in these spaces. And um, we've had elder people, um, people from all different cultures and children. Often when we're doing these food forest builds, people will ask, can they bring their children? Well, we used to have a saying that was, um, children are our future. So I'd like to bring that back because as we can get them connected to soil and connected to food, that will ensure a future for us. But as children, um, currently a lot of children aren't familiar with how to grow food. They just know that it grows in the grocery store. So we want to mitigate that as well. So this is um, something I want to share, quorum sensing. Um, I learned it from um, a talk that I did in Montreal some years ago um, about soil ecology from David Johnson, a molecular biologist and research scientist. And what he said that quorum sensing is microorganisms that you can't see in the soil, uh, so not visible to the naked eye. And it takes about five or six different species that get together to create something that they all need. So I think this is a great example of community that we could, we could really uh, take a page from microorganisms that we can't even see with the naked eye, they know what to do. So, um, and also food forestry, as you've seen um, in some of the slides that I have some of these 
um, sustainable development goals. Now, food forestry actually hits all 17 of the sustainable development goals. I wasn't really aware of that. I had, I think, six or seven, and I did a talk in Huntsville. And then the um, audience that was there um, started to quickly put up their hands and say, nope, you hit this, you hit this, you hit this. So it's one of the only things that I know of that hits all of the 17 sustainable development goals that were outlined by the UN. So I want to just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I... Um, I'm a landscape uh, designer and community capacity builder, as you've heard. I was 13 when my family emigrated from London, England to Oakville, Ontario. I found myself immersed in a predominantly white community where I was perceived as lesser and at times a threat because of the, my skin color. By my 18th birthday, Canada finally felt like home. That same year, I won a human rights case against my employer for racial discrimination in the workplace. It was an intense and intimidating process for me as a youth. I was born in 1969 at the height of the hippie era to my Jamaican mother and my British father. My parents were on the cusp of an era when it was illegal to be together. They were radicals by proxy of their unwavering love for each other. Um, I want to go back to remembering our global indigenous roots and creation stories and show you this image. Many will be familiar with the image on the right, which is on my right, um, and it's the indigenous medicine wheel. Well, on the other side, this is my family, my people were stolen from um, the Congo, and I know that from the oral history within my family. Now, this is the our um, spiritual, um, the Congolese medicine wheel, which you can see is very similar. The East Indians have a very similar one as well. So many global indigenous people have these practices. So we're more the same than we are different. Regenerative agriculture, what I found was an African indigenous system developed over millennia in Benin, West Africa which was revived in the United States by Dr. George Washington Carver of Tuskegee University in the early 1900s. Carver codified the use of crop rotation in combination with the planting of nitrogen fixing legumes and detailed how to regenerate soil biology. His system is known as regenerative agriculture. So a lot of these terms that we're using um, have some um, in African diaspora roots as does the CSA, which we use, and many people are getting CSAs. Now, CSAs came out of when um, the slaves were freed, the captives were freed, but then weren't allowed to buy, purchase any of the food. So what they did was they started growing things like you grow carrots, I grow potatoes, and then we share. That's where CSA came from. So it's interesting that some of these historical things we, we don't know about that have been erased. So that caused me to, um, to do some research, which I found out about the Queensbush Settlement, which was a thriving Black community of approximately 3,000 people who lived between London, Hamilton, and the Great Bruce areas of southwestern Ontario from 1820 to 1867, receiving no reprise for their plight. The freed African diasporas cultivated the land under harsh conditions, often without tools. In 1840, the Crown commenced surveying the land and pressed it out of reach of the Black farmers, forcing them to abandon their land and communities. Then in 1850, the government launched a program offering that same land to, to free new Canadians. Now, I gave you a little bit of background as to um, how I came to Canada and what have you. So I grew up in Oakville. I didn't hear about Queen's Bush in my, in my history, which was just right here. And I was actually, my house is on the Queen's Bush settlement. Um, and I didn't, um, being in agricultural service cir circles, um, I didn't hear anything about it. And then once I did find out about it, um, I started to talk to my colleagues and they also knew nothing about it. So that caused me to go on the Sankofa 100 Miles to Freedom Tour 2022 um, this past summer, a celebration. 
to bring awareness of the triumphs, the resilience, the perseverance and contributions of the African diaspora women of Southwestern Ontario. It was a homage to our brave warrior grandmothers whose names we do not know, without whom we would not exist. What I did find on that journey though, was that um, women were also at the bottom of the pile. So unless you were a, as a, also as an African diaspora, if you were a teacher, a preacher or a preacher's wife, there was no mention of you. So as I went on this tour and it was a big ask to find the oral histories of our of great grandmothers and these kinds of things, I couldn't find any because they're just not listed and they're simply not there. I also um, wanted to look for the indigenous connection with um, the African diaspora, because as you know, we had 200 years of a captivity where there were um, two thirds were indigenous and one third were African diaspora. So our lineage had to have crossed there. So on the tour, I didn't find um, any of that history either. And I have a lot of alliances with indigenous people in my community. And also as I was going across Southwestern Ontario, I could find nothing. And what I found out was that we were so low on the totem pole that if the lineage is crossed and you are part of the Black Diaspora or the, um, or the indigenous community, it wasn't in your best interest to say that I'm both. So th that way it was squashed. So there is no history of that because of the shame and the guilt that was associated with it. So I've realized that I probably have to write those stories myself. So that's something for 2023 to look out for. So when I wanna share that Sankofa is a tree word from Ghana, which means to go back and fetch the knowledge that was left behind. And that was really the tour. Um, and that's been the premise of my work now. So the tour follows the path of our ancestors and it was to uncover the shared contributions of our fate here in Ontario, honoring our ancestors' triumphs, our resilience and our tenacity. In doing so, we will be uncovering, remembering and giving voice to her story. So there are many, this is a site that's just in Hawksville here, which is about 20 minutes from my house. And a lot of these um, cemeteries are listed as abandoned um, and nobody takes care of them. Um, but this is a testament to the fact that we were here and I've been to these sites and sat there and watched the Mennonite buggies going by and realizing that that was us, <laughs> that we were there and we cleared all of this land before that time. So it's important for us to remember when we're thinking about agriculture, not just in Southwestern Ontario, but the whole of the country. And this is not a black history. This is not a black story. This is not for um, one month of the year. This is our story. This is our Canadian history. Bad as it is, good as it is, all the parts are in. So the Sankofa 100 Miles to Freedom tour um, is the untold story of the African diaspora in Ontario communities. There are many black settlements, which I found out I didn't even know from um, Amherstburg, which is at the tip of Southwestern Ontario, um, which is, uh, crosses over to Detroit. And many of the African diaspora, including Harriet Tubman, crossed that river. And even today, um, many people will say that you, you, it's a very dangerous um, river to go in. And the fact that many, as I was sitting there on the, on the shore, yes, we have recorded um, many that survived, like Harriet Tubman and went back, but many didn't survive. And so this is a homage to those that didn't survive. You can find um, a lot about the tour on my YouTube channel that I created for the Sankofa tour. And you can find it at Nicola Jane Soul to Soil. And I've recorded a lot of, um, a lot of the, uh, the people that I interacted with. One of the things that I wanted to do on the tour was that I built out a van for myself that I would stay in. Um, I didn't book sites along the way because I also wanted to expose and show the kindness that people have. 
that we're not talking about from the government down, but just from on the ground. You know, if we have um, um, some kind of catastrophe you know, on the ground, you know, um, some kind of climate catastrophe, people help people, people help their neighbors. And I have to tell you that I, I stayed the very first night alone. I stayed one more night alone um, in a uh, Walmart parking lot. And then I stayed one more night alone because I just had to escape. I had envisioned that there would be a lot of writing and a lot of solitude on this tour and there was not. People were so kind and it was amazing to me that I would start each morning out um, on my journey. And by the end of the day, I would be sitting around a campfire with people that I didn't know at the beginning of the day that shared their food with me, were happy to hear this story, wanted to hear more and wanted to really be a part of it. So I want that to be a testament that this is not a story of guilt bashing, but a story of reconciliation. And I really believe that through soil connection and our connection to each other, we can then find our way to reconciliation because it's not a blame, shame, or guilt story. It's our history, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We must open the doors and see to it they remain open so others can pass through. I did, at the end of my tour, write a book called BLM Collection. Um, by Nicola Jane. It's available on Amazon now. It's quite a hard read, um, but it's a worthwhile read to really get an understanding of what it means to be Black, what it means to be Black today, what it has meant in the past, and what it can mean in the future. So I hope that you can um, get your hands on the book and share in this collective history that we all share. Our vision is land observation, preservation, regeneration, and reconciliation in land acknowledgement, food security, sovereignty, and justice for all. You can see here on the left, I've put the water. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, um, the experiment that was done whereby you say um, it was a scientist that had said some kind words to water and some awful words. And you can see that the water before and then after uh, a wish was put on the water, how it created this beautiful pattern. And I see us in community that way. If we move forward with love, um, with the language of love, with heart-centered language, um, we have reconciliation, it's just in front of us. I invite you to join us together. We have the capacity to create a resilient and restorative ecological future for all our relations. I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me here, Asante. Well, Asante Sanda. <laughs> uh, thank you very much um, for this presentation. It's It gives everybody a lot to even be grateful for, just even what you're talking about and what we can um, think about afterwards is yeah even just that heart-centered language um, the the idea that we've had histories that have been erased or buried over time but the importance of them the importance of the stories that you're collecting and sharing um, I just wonder if I have a question and that is are you hopeful at this point that more and more people are are getting this or sort of appreciating and are willing to open up and explore a bit more of the themes that you're talking about, the values that you're talking about, the histories that you mentioned. Is this something that you think is resonating with people and is expanding? Absolutely. Um, before I even got on the tour and I started to say that I was going to be doing it, I received so much information from our community alone that I still haven't processed. Um, when I started to talk about Queen's Bush, as I said, um, many people um, were just as distraught as I was, not just African diaspora, not just white, everybody. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I absolutely do. I, I do seed ball workshops um, and I've had, and I've gone into schools with kindergartens and I'll have kids circling me, you know, um, because they're so afraid to get dirty. 
So, um, <laughs> which is tough because anybody born in our generation, uh, mud pies and mud play was a very big deal. And we spent a lot of time getting dirty. And there's microorganisms and minerals just from touching soil that we get benefit from. We hear a lot about um, um, grounding and forest bathing. And that's just basically being barefoot um, and what I recently found out is not only are we taking in from this grounding, we're also releasing from, from ourselves into the soil. So again, nothing is self-sustaining. It's, a, it's a, a reciprocal interreaction. And we often say, is this self-sustaining? Well, plants don't self-sustain. They need water, they need air, they need um, sun. So there, it's not possible. So, you know, we can't do reconciliation in silos. I believe that um, we are inundated with really terrible media. And there are many of us out there, but we just don't hear about it. Every time I do a food forest build, um, more than 40 people will show up often. So I had to stop even um, advertising because it has to be the people within the community that have the buy-in that build it. It's not sustainable if I come from my community to Ottawa and build and come back here. That doesn't work. So often I won't um, advertise. And every single time, you know, children are involved and people feel really good that they have an opportunity to not only um, work together, to um, reconcile soil. Soil is where we all are, right? In, in, in every culture, in every place on the globe, soil is everything. When we die, we become soil. So surely plants are our kin. So yes, um, there is a way forward. And that's why I do my work. We did one at Crow's Shield Lodge, which is an indigenous land back site. And we built, um, I think uh, 700 square feet there on a Sunday morning at nine o'clock in the rain and 60 people showed up and we did um, a land acknowledgement and we did a, a, a circle um, and people said that this was this was more empowering than going to church on a Sunday morning yeah. and really what is our church each other our bodies you know creation itself so yeah yeah well it seems like yeah you carry that um energy as well like this this energy and it exudes from from you this positivity so yeah i do see a yearning i do see the um the community need for this yeah against everything but as we know culture is constructed and can be deconstructed and we can the narratives that we share and the stories that we tell have a a way to expand and and grow. So I think this is what's coming up um, in a lot of different places are examples of what you're talking about. And so and I, I also want to add that climate change is real. Yeah. And uh, we're we are going to have to band together. Yeah, and culture and race too. doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, growing food together, uh, biodiversity, polycultures, these are all um, languages that need to be um, familiar to everybody because we all have an opportunity to get together and mitigate climate change. And it is possible with these kinds of going back to our indigenous ways of dealing with land. You know, for, if you go back even further from the African diaspora coming here and before colonization, um, this whole area all the way down into North Carolina um, was taken care of by indigenous peoples. And when co uh, colonials came, they said, oh, this is wild land. But it wasn't. It was very um, systematically taken care of. A great example is a log house. You know, the, to build a log house, they, the tree has to be 100 years old. So when the indigenous people were building the new log home, they were at the same time planting for the log home in 100 years. You know, so these are people that were working with the land and not against. And so that's what permaculture does is we're looking at rather than and this is kind of how we do things. We buy our property. We're like, OK, this is what we're going to do. We clear it away and then add what we think we need to add instead of taking the time to see 
What is happening on your site? What animals are coming here? Where is the water moving around? And thinking about, you know, even when you're planting, a lot of people are like, I don't want to plant edibles, but edibles, remember, they also have flowers too. So even if you don't want to eat it, you can plant it for biodiversity. You can plant it for uh, all our relations. Well, and you're just, that sort of reminded me of what you were saying earlier about the land observation as being a starting point too. It's having that sort of thoughtfulness or reflection observation built in and then preservation regeneration. So yeah, those are all of the, the fundamentals, like sort of the, the principles behind what you're talking about. And again, those are things that it, it does take sort of awareness and people to really understand these concepts and to, to put them into practice as well, it relies on sort of a values and a, a worldview as well. And, and matching the moment, as you say, climate change, climate crisis that we're in, biodiversity, like that's another thing that has to be addressed and we all can, can actually do something about it. And so it's so tangible when you're talking about soil and um, place, like where you are and getting involved. And so, yeah, there's so much potential there to make a big cumulative impact. There's a lot to unpack. If we had the day, we could get into it a lot more, but we just don't have that kind of time. But even with the food forestry, you know, we do 250 square feet and it never takes more than two and a half hours with um, between 10 to 20 people. Um, yeah. So the idea is that people can learn these techniques and go back and do them on their site. And even people, you know, people don't have land. You, you can grow tomatoes in your windowsill. You can grow them on your balcony. And that is mitigation climate change small as it is but these small um, efforts do help you know microgreens often people are like well I can't get a community garden or I don't have land microgreens have more nutrition in them than a mature vegetable so that's um, a great way to go especially in winter or if you don't have access there's no reason for you not to be able to have fresh organic food that will feed you. You know, yeah. they're even trying to make a pill out of um, from soil minerals because what they found is that just the act of um, working with the soil is an antidepressant, you know, and there's horticultural therapeutic associations, which I did a talk for last year. And I just love that combination of words, therapeutic horticulture, because mm -hmm. it's so true when it's the only place I often have a lot of chatter in my brain, but it's the only place that when I'm doing that, I don't think of anything. So I often will encourage people to, you know, um, build a small micro pond in the yard and put some fish in it so you can have a little pilgrimage to your own yard because it works the same as watching um, a waterfall or the ocean or a lake where you just become one and we all need that because there's so much input like with the internet like what you want to know you can go and know it in, a, in an instant but how do we stop that chatter in the brain um and that busyness of that feeling of busyness that even though we're not busy, we feel as though we are. A friend of mine is a very hyperactive person and she did, built one and she said it was the first time she sat there and she sat for over an hour watching the fish thinking of nothing. So yeah. I like to offer you that even if you have a little fish bowl, you know, so it just goes to show you that what you can learn just from fish. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, on that note, to that end point, I, I want to thank you very much for doing this today. We really appreciate it. This recording will be on Soul's website and please feel free to share it with your network. And everybody, I guess, took note of the YouTube video, Soil or Soul to Soil. Nicola Jane, um, Soul to Jane. Soil. Yeah, Soul to Soil. Um, please check that out. The beautiful book that you wrote and um, Grand River Food Forestry, I guess, as well. Yeah, GrandRiverFoodForestry.com. And everybody else, there's lots of other videos from the Souls uh, 2022 Year of the Ecological Garden Series. It's all on Souls' website, so please check them out as well. And everybody, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again next time. Asante, one love. <laughs>